glory, yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness, somebody touched me. <laughs> oh, holy. Praise the Lord. Good night. I love that. Yes, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes, I will. I'll glorify and praise him in spite of uh, whatever's going on in my life. It's just a, you choose to do that. It's power out of your life, and it's testimony of what God's doing in you and what God wants to do in you. It's the way of life, isn't it? That uh, you would just praise and glorify him and take all of your burdens and your yeah, cares before yeah. the Lord and, uh, and lay there, lay them there, and, and God says, I'll do something with them. And we just believe that by faith and we stand on that and we do it. Jesus, when he was here on earth, uh, promised, made, made promises to his disciples that I'm sure they didn't fully comprehend what the fullness of what he was saying to them. And now, after 2,000 years of, uh, of history and, and, and watching and seeing uh, fulfillments and being led by the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of us and gives us wisdom, I think we have a, a, a much deeper knowledge or a, but, a much deeper understanding of the fullness of what Jesus meant by some of the things he said to them, like in John 14, uh, he said to them, I say to you, he who believes in me, uh, the works that I do shall he do, and even greater works will he do because I go to my Father. And so because Jesus went to his Father and was lifted from this earth, and, and, and now uh, by miraculous forces that we, we probably won't even understand until we get to heaven one day, yeah. Uh, he has returned uh, in the form of the Holy Spirit, and he comes and he lives in, 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 our, in our hearts. He indwells himself in us. The, the Christ that lifted off the earth has returned and now lives on the inside of us, and, and he indwells his word, and he indwells his body, which is the church, and he indwells the, us, believers, which he lives on the inside of us. And he saves us and he fills us in order that he will, might glorify us one day, that one day we might stand before him and as Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 says, that we will then see him face to face yeah. and we will know as we are known, which means that we'll know what God knows because God knows everything about us. And one of these days when we get to heaven, Jesus promised uh, you'll know what I know, which is everything. I've heard people say this before. Uh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus why this happened or, or what did he mean by this or, or I, I've always wondered about this. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jesus. No, 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 no. You won't have to ask. When you get to heaven, you'll already know <laughs> because the Lord made that kind of promise. But right now, the Lord has to work in us so that he, he can work out of us so that he can work through us yeah. to impact this old crazy world that he lives in out there. And as he comes and lives on the inside of us, he brings two great assets with him. First are his gifts, the gifts of his spirit, which the Bible talks about in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 5, Romans uh, 7. And he describes these gifts, these works of the Holy Spirit that he gives gifts to men as he wills, as the Holy Spirit wills, not as we will, not as we ask for, but as God sees is necessary for the works that Jesus did on this earth to be manifest in some way through our lives. And then the second asset that he brings are his gifts, are his fruits. And his fruits are not, are not like the gifts. The gifts operate physically, and, 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 and it, they do things to present Christ and, and the work of Christ to this world. But the fruit, on the other hand, is the personality of Jesus or the character of Jesus. So the fruit describe God's character. What is God like? What, what is God, what, what is God uh, full of? How does God manifest himself and, and, and what, what is he like? And so we've been in a study of these nine different descriptions that uh, the Apostle Paul gives us in Galatians chapter 5 
to tell us what these fruit really are. Now remember, these nine fruit are not just something that Paul jotted down on the back of his napkin while he was waiting at the airport. Um, the, these nine that are listed here have been handpicked by the Holy Spirit to describe what God is like. So these are powerful characteristics and powerful traits. They're not just casually placed here to say, well, he's kind of like this, 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 this. I mean, you have to remember that the reason all of these are lifted, uh, listed is because God says uh, these are powerful characteristics of God's nature that he puts in us so that he can work through us, through these, to affect the world that we live in. And, and it says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, and against such there is no law. So we've now found ourselves uh, about five down the, down the road here. The first one was love, and you remember I shared with you that love is possibly the greatest of these. The uh, Bible says now abides faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So most likely all of the gifts work out of love. Uh, they all manifest themselves through that first uh, powerful gift, and they flow out of the gift of the fruit of love. And then joy. There's no joy apart from Jesus. You know, the world's always looking for joy. But the world thinks that you can find joy in circumstances in life. But the Word teaches us that you don't change your circumstances to be joyful. The way you are joyful is that Jesus comes inside of you and changes what's on the inside of you that you can be joyful in spite of your circumstances. Then we talked about peace, not the kind of peace that the world gives, but the kind of peace that Jesus gives. Yeah. And that peace comes when we make peace with God. Mm -hmm. Then last week we talked about long-suffering. Some people call it patience, but I think long-suffering probably describes it just a little bit deeper than patience. Yeah. Yeah. But long-suffering allows us to um, endure suffering and, and, and face it and use it like a tool that God sends into our life so that he can use the suffering that we are enduring so that we might know him better, not just know about him, but we can know him better through, these, through this relationship of, of, of suffering and his response in our life to that suffering as we endure it. And he uses it to do many things uh, in the process of, of our moving through suffering in life. Now we've come to the fifth Fruit, the fruit of gentleness. Uh, not a word that you might think to be associated with God, really. Do we really think of God as being gentle in life? Not really our concept uh, for the most part of God. A lot of concepts of God is very hard, very powerful. Uh, God is something to be fearful of. Uh, he'll turn you into a crispy critter in a moment, you know. You'll that God is, uh, to, for, for God to be gentle is a, is a concept that uh, I think would be probably foreign to many of our thoughts about God, especially in connection with how gentleness might be a characteristic or, or an attribute of God that would be powerful to change anything in this old word, world we live in. Uh, the concept of gentleness is used in the Old Testament and the New Testament, so the word that is used in the Greek language in the New Testament is Christates. It's sometimes translated kindness. Uh, it means to uh, it means to, to to have a have a compassion to give. So, the word in the New Testament gives us the idea that that this gentleness is a is a form of of, of kindness and. And, and with an attribute to, to give to others and be motivated by a kind virtue, a kind nature. The Old Testament word is a Hebrew word, and it's the word avana. And avana adds to the concept of kindness by telling us that, that gentleness relates to something that is mild as 
it's a medical term, really, and it, it talks about rather than, than, a, than a medicine being harsh, uh, it'll be mild and it'll be, it'll be gentle. So together, the concept of gentleness that the Bible gives us is that, um, that gentleness is, is something that doesn't drastically reorder your life, but something that gently touches your life. There, there are uh, some big issues in this world that we live in. Uh, senseless mass shootings. We've had several in this past week, and it just seems like they're more and more prevalent all the time. Bullying, road rage, you name it, abuse, hate crimes, terrorism, discrimination. Um, you know, I could, I could go on. And you would think that the church might have more to offer this old crazy world to affect it and change it than just these simple nine characteristics of, of God. The world's shooting uh, bullets and firing missiles, and somehow God wants us to change the world with just a few characteristics of him. Take this, uh, take this fifth characteristic, gentleness. I don't know about you, but as I was mentioning before, uh, gentleness seems to be a little, a little fluffy, if you want to look at it that way. God, we're going to change the world through gentleness. I mean, really, they're shooting bullets and missiles, and, 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 and they're angry, and they're bitter, and they're hostile, and they're all of this. And you want us to change the world by using the characteristic like gentleness? What do you think of when you think of gentleness? You think of uh, what a a baby wrapped in a in a nice warm blanket, or or uh, you think about a a kind elderly woman sitting knitting by the window with a cup of tea in her hand, or that that kind of thing. I mean, uh, nothing wrong with that, but that just doesn't seem like something that's going to have enough power to change the world that we live in. And imagine how it sounded to the Romans. Paul was in Rome, he was in prison in Rome when he wrote this. And imagine how uh, a list like this appeared to the Romans who heard what Paul said and no one in the Roman Empire would, think, would ever think of any god as being gentle. I mean, they thought that you, were, you, fear, you fear gods, you, you try to appease gods, you, you need a powerful god, a god that could step in and crush your enemies and a God that would show up and be powerful and, 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 and provide all your needs and, and rule the kingdom. I mean, a gentle God to the Romans uh, wouldn't win any battles. But remember now, the Apostle Paul is not just picking out of thin air and saying, you know, it'd be nice if you would be like this. He's being led by the Holy Spirit to say, this is what God is. This is the nature and the character of God, and every single one of them tell us something unique about the character and the nature of God. So in the Roman world, if the church was going to compete with Rome, it was going to need to put something more powerful out than gentleness. Because <laughs> gentleness wasn't going to do the job. Yeah, yeah. Or would it? Perhaps this is precisely why the Lord listed gentleness as one of his attributes and showed us that gentleness is a powerful tool and a powerful weapon to use against the harshness and the bitterness and the anger of this world. Well, if that's true, what can gentleness do against a, an angry, hostile world? Is gentleness powerful enough to affect the world that we live in? Well, I want you to look at four characteristics of gentleness, and let's just see how powerful gentleness could be to change and, and, to, and to impact this world that we live in. Because remember, these characteristics that God has, these attributes of his nature have been listed for us so that we can see the nature of God and how God's nature can change this world. He can change us 
And this is our attitude. This is our nature. This is what God puts on the inside of us. And remember, this is not a list where you can pick and choose. It doesn't say the fruits are like, okay, I'm going to be able to get some of them. They're all bunch, you know, I mean, they're, they're individual. Like I can choose peace and uh, I like uh, goodness and, you know, I, I, I want to be self-control, so I'm going to get that one. But, you know, that long-suffering stuff, I, whew, I don't want any of that. And, and don't give me this uh, gentleness kind of stuff because that seems a little sissy, you know, and I'm a little fluffy, so I don't really need that. No, 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 no. When Paul was talking about right before these verses, he was talking about how the flesh is. He said the works of the flesh are, and then he lists about 19 things, you know. In other words, all of these things are individual. You, 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 you can choose the works of the flesh are. They're plural. And you could be a murderer, but you not, might not necessarily be a liar. You could be somebody that uh, mistreats people, but you don't have to be a bank robber. I mean, you can choose individually the works of the flesh. And then he turns right around in the next verse and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is singular. In other words, you, all of these next things I'm saying, you're going to get all of them. You, you, you can't just pick and choose out of these. And so what he's doing is contrasting the works of the flesh against the work of the Spirit of the Lord in your life. And so this fifth one, is it really powerful? Does it, will it really do anything to change the world? Well, let's just look at four facts regarding gentleness. Number one, gentleness is countercultural to all arrogant self-serving power. I know that might sound a little underwhelming, and it might sound a little like a social studies class. I don't really want to get bogged down in a, in a social studies issue here, but I just want to, I want, you, I want to show you, I think, a powerful, a powerful concept of gentleness and how gentleness has the power to, to change a culture that we live in. Uh, the term countercultural um, is like it, the word would give you the indication is a culture that has values and lifestyles that are in opposition to those of a current culture. Now, I know in, in church speak and in church language and in denomination language, many church groups and denominations and church bodies uh, want to believe that the church in the world we live in now is countercultural to the world we live in. That it actually walks in opposition to the lifestyles and the, and the way the world is walking. And we, we want to think that and we think like that. But, but uh, just to show you, and, and I'm, I don't want to get bogged down in terms here, but, but for the most part nowadays, the church should be countercultural, but it's basically not countercultural because it only has a few things that it really goes against. For the most part, the church walks in step with the way the culture is going, except maybe uh, in ideas like abortion or marriage or uh, sexual activity, those things we may come against. But for the most part, uh, we just kind of move along with other things that the society is involved in that are, that are just as contrary to the things of God as, as anything else. So the, the church now is probably not countercultural, but it is um, a subculture of the, of the culture that you live in. To be a counterculture, it, it's not, it's not, um, it's not, uh, marching in the same direction, just wearing a, a different uniform and, and, and marching to a different drummer, to be countercultural means to be marching in a different direction to a different drummer wearing a different uniform. So in, in, in our generations in life, let me just say that Jesus and following Jesus is a countercultural thing. Jesus was counter to the culture that he lived in. The gentleness of Jesus was countercultural. It went against everything that the Roman Empire uh, was. Uh, Jesus touched lepers. Jesus cared for the poor. I mean, Jesus embraced uh, the outcast of society. He washed the disciples' feet. He, 
He ate and he drank with sinners. And matter of fact, that was one of the charges that they laid against Jesus as he was on the cross, that he was a friend of sinners. This was contrary to everything that the Roman Empire stood for. So Jesus was, uh, was radical, and he, uh, he disrupted the status quo of the society that he lives in. And so one of the natures of God and the characteristics of God that he puts on the inside of us is the concept of gentleness. And gentleness is, count, is countercultural to any society that is ruled by power or by arrogance. It, it, it marches directly in opposition to that society. So it manifests itself as a whole different kind of life to live. So this is what Jesus said that we would be as his children. If, if you live dynamically for the Lord in this society that we are living in today, you are going to be countercultural to the society that we live in, and you're going to stand out like a sore thumb in this society, and you're going to impact the people that you're around and the people that you involve yourself in life because of the characteristic of gentleness or kindness that God has put in your spirit. One of the, one of, one of the, one of the teachings that Jesus gave us that just shows you exactly what I'm talking about with him being so countercultural to the world that he lived in is one of probably the most famous addresses that Jesus taught, and, and it's in Matthew, uh, it's in Matthew uh, uh, 5, verses 1 through 12, and, it, and it's called the Beatitudes. And look, let, let, let's just read them. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you remember, I know many of you were here years ago, I, I taught on the Beatitudes, and I told you that the word blessed is markyrios in Greek, and markyrios means uh, happy. And so what he's really saying is, I want, let, me, let, me tell you how you, let me tell you how you live if you're living in the kingdom of God. And look at how contrary this is to the culture that they lived in and the culture that we live. Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are you when you realize how much you need the Lord, because when you realize how much you need the Lord, the Lord can do something on the inside of you. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. God, I don't want to mourn. I want to be happy. I want to feel good. And he said, you're blessed. You're happy when you mourn because when you mourn, God can come on the inside of you and give you something to be joyful about. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We think about meek as being weak, and we think that if meek ever did inherit the earth, some bully would come along and say, give me that, and he would give me, yes, sir, squeak, you know. That is so countercultural to what the world would be like. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled directly contrary to the way people live nowadays. Happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Do you realize how countercultural all of this is to those that would be hearing these kind of things about how the kingdom of God was ruled and reigned. Uh, blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall have their eyes scratched out. No, no, blessed are the... <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. All of these, if Jesus was running for president, this would be his platform. And his platform would be radical and countercultural against everything that we live in in this world that we live in. And then when he taught us to pray, you know, the model prayer, where the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And one of the first things Jesus said, this is how you pray. You pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Next line, 
Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, this is what I want you to pray. I want you to pray that everything on earth will change to operate like heaven operates. Where God is, is already ruling and reigning and where Jesus Christ is the king. When you pray, pray that God's kingdom would come on earth these are the instruments of God's kingdom and that the earth would operate like this and change the way it operates. So gentleness is countercultural and it powerfully affects the way the culture perceives and acts and it directly comes in conflict against the type of life that most of us live and God uses it because it's a powerful instrument in order to change lives. It's a powerful tool. It's not fluffy and soft. It's a wonderful backdoor kind of weapon to come against the society and the norms that society lives. And remember, the reason God fills us with this and the reason he uses these is because he wants these to come out of us so that when others receive this, it changes the way they live, the way they think, the way they are. So one of, the, one of the facts about gentleness is that it's countercultural. Let me give you a second fact. Fact number two, gentleness fills the earth, but evil makes the news. I'm going to read you uh, about three or four little short stories, and I'm not going to tell them because if I tell them, I'm going to get way bogged down. Y'all know how I tell stories, um, and, uh, and I know I'll get way bogged down, but I just want, to, I want you to see what I'm talking about. So I, I just kind of, uh, you know, one of them I, I, I personally experienced, and I wrote it down, and I'm going to read it first. But what I'm saying here about gentleness filling the earth, but evil making the news, I'm, I'm going to report to you that I think that there really is a lot of gentleness or kindness in this world that we live in. Now, the reason that you don't notice it is because our media nowadays uh, chooses not to exalt and magnify these acts of gentleness. They seem intent on covering the lowest common denominator of man in life of hate and violence and rage and hurt and anger and prejudice and uh, resentment and hostility. And I mean, you know, I could, could go on, but that there actually is a lot of really of real kindness in this world that we live in. And it does affect the people that come in contact with, with gentleness. Let me read you this story. Just this past week, I was fueling my bus at a local truck, truck stop on County Farm Road. And when I finished fueling, I went into the store to get a bottle of water. And since I've been studying this message, I noticed something that I've seen in one form or another countless times in my life. As I approached the door, I witnessed an elderly white gentleman was entering the convenience store at the same time an elderly black woman was coming out. He quickly stepped to the side and held the door open for her. As she passed, she politely said, thank you, sir. To which he replied, you are most certainly welcome. You have a wonderful afternoon. And as I saw that, I thought, my goodness, is this not a big deal? <laughs> Say, not a big deal. I said, we're in Mississippi. <laughs> Remember that. Not, not, long, not too long ago, people were killing each other over racial issues. The generation in which they and I grew up was segregated and for the most part was full of racial prejudice. But, but they were kind to each other respectful, honoring each other in that brief moment in the doorway of a convenience store. It wasn't something that drastically reordered the life of this country, but it was countercultural. It was a gentle touch. What I just testified was watching kindness change the world in a, in a doorway. A woman with breast cancer that had lost her hair due to her chemo treatments was stunned to learn that her family's meal had been paid for by a stranger. The kind diner explained in a note delivered by the waitress on the bill receipt, he stated on the bill receipt, I lost my wife to cancer five years ago, and I know how tough it can be going through this. Your meal is on me. 
And Mrs. Edwards, who received the gift, wrote on her Facebook account, more than anything, having cancer has shown me that there are a lot of good people in this world. Whoever you are, thank you. While going through a divorce, my mother fretted over new worries. No, no income, the same bills, and no way to afford groceries. It was around this time that she started finding boxes of food outside her door every morning. This went on for months until she was able to land a job. We never did find out who it was that left the groceries for us, but they truly saved our lives. Jamie Bolin, Emmett, Idaho. One more. Leaving the store, I returned to my car only to find that I'd locked my key and cell phone inside. A teenager riding his bicycle saw me kick a tire and say a few choice words. Um, what's wrong, he asked. I explained my situation. But even if I could call my wife, I said she can't bring me her car keys since this is our only car. He handed me his cell phone and said, call your wife and tell her that I'm coming to get her key. That's seven miles round trip, man. Don't worry about it. 45 minutes later, he returned with the key. I offered him some money, but he refused. Let's just say I, I needed the exercise, he said. <laughs> then, like a cowboy in the movies, he rode off into the sunset. <laughs> Clarence Stevens, Nicholasville, Kentucky. There are hundreds of thousands, even millions of acts of kindness rendered in our world every day. They don't make the news. They just make a difference. That's right. And gentleness changes the world one incident <laughs> at a time. It's a powerful weapon. Let me give you fact number three. Fact number three, gentleness fights fire with water. You know, you've heard the statement, you, you fight fire with fire, right? I always thought, that's kind of backwards to me, you know. We're going to fight fire with fire. I'm not sure that's going to work. But I'll tell you what we fight fire with. We fight fire with, with water. You've heard the phrase, uh, you know, kill them with kindness. Well, that phrase likely comes from, a, from a, um, an English proverb. And I know this is going to sound funny, but the English proverb is, the ape kills her young with kindness telling you that sometimes apes, the mothers, uh, are so affectionate and loving to their, to their babies that in hugging them out of an act of love, they actually crush the little fella uh, and, and, and they die. Now, that, I'm not saying that we should hurt someone, <laughs> but, I, but I am saying that what gentleness will do and what kindness will do is Kindness can, can kill hatred because kindness can, can crush hate. It's such, a powerful, it's such a powerful weapon to use. Paul, uh, in writing to Romans, in Romans chapter 12, uh, quoted some, a couple of verses out of the book of Proverbs. And, and here's what he said. He said in Romans 12, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, most of the time when we read that verse, we're thinking, okay, God is showing us how to get revenge, right? God says, if you want to get revenge against somebody, uh, feed them when they're hungry and give them water when they're thirsty. And if you do that, it's going to be like pouring coals of fire on their head which is like, uh, you know, totally embarrassing them or paying them back for being so ugly and all that kind of stuff. But is that what that really means there? I mean, it seems like, it seems to me that that, that would be counterproductive. It says, if, you, if your enemy's hungry, feed him, okay? So now I'm feeding him. If he's thirsty, uh, give him a drink. So I'm going to feed him and I'm going to take care of the needs of his life and then I'm going to pour something on his head that's going to 
hurt him and all of that. I mean, that, that, that doesn't seem right at all, especially when you consider the context of chapter 12. The context of that whole chapter is living like a Christian and how that is going to affect the people around you and the people that you can minister to with kindness. And the, and the whole chapter is really summed up in that last verse, the verse right behind the one we just read that says, do not, uh, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so uh, pouring hot coals on his head, it likely meant putting hot coals in a, in a container that someone carried on their head so that they can take it back and have fire so they can be warm in their home or fire off the altar. And so really what it's talking about, the point of Romans 12 is that if you want to win somebody over, you win them over with kindness, with gentleness. And I know that sounds, you know, it sounds ridiculous and I know it's not easy, but but how, does, how do we overcome prejudice and hate? Uh, we tried everything, right? I mean, we tried physical force. And if physical force could work against prejudice and hate and arrogance and pride and hard hearts and, and, and broken paths and closed minds, if, if physical force could work against that, uh, then all of that would be solved in our world. But it's not. If being intelligent could overcome evil, uh, why hadn't that worked? Why is it that many intelligent people are actually not part, you know, are not part of the solution? They're part of the problem. <laughs> They're evil, and they, and they put their evil deeds before us. If technology would be able to solve that problem, um, that problem would already be solved. But as a matter of fact, technology is probably not part of the solution. It's probably more part of the problem. I mean, the internet is good for a lot of things, but it's also very evil in some things. It makes evil much easier to flourish than it would naturally before. And business and medicine and arts and science, they can't overcome e evil because that's not their task. It, it, it's not their expertise. It's not their purpose. But kindness seems like such a fluffy concept, but actually it, it has the power to paralyze evil. And you overcome evil, according to God, with good. And so God says, here's a weapon, here's a powerful weapon that will help you overcome evil in life. If you will treat evil with gentleness, it will crush evil. Evil can't stand up against kindness and gentleness. And no matter what the enemy might be, somehow they can't resist and stay, and stay upset against the, the goodness of God and the gentleness of God. Then the fourth fact regarding gentleness is every act of gentleness reclaims a world that belongs to God. You remember the story of the woman that they called in the act of adultery, brought her to Jesus. They brought her to Jesus because they wanted to trick Jesus. They wanted to box Jesus in on a, on a, on a problem where no matter how he answered, it, it wasn't going to be right. And so they brought her, she, they caught her in adultery, in the very act of adultery, and they brought her to Jesus and said, all right, Jesus, the law says that this woman should be stoned to death. She broke the law. So what do you say? And Jesus was riding on the ground. He was just doodling along on the ground over there. What do you say, Jesus? Uh, she should die is what the law says. Uh, now let's see what you're going to say about it. And he stops doodling on the ground and and so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, well, here's what I say. He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. 
I don't know what he was writing on the ground, but, but I propose to you that as he was writing on the ground and he just said, let the, let, the, let the one of you that's without sin go ahead and cast the first stone. And as they began to think about what he said, and I'm thinking, and they began to see what he was doodling on the ground, that it began to convict their, their hearts about themselves. Most likely what he was writing on the ground was a list of their sins. And as he wrote the sin, oh, adulterer, liar, embezzler, cheater, you know, and as they saw their sin listed down there, they said, ah, uh, yeah, I'll just go mess up the way. Let me get on up out of here. And as Jesus listed the sin of everybody that was standing there, as they saw their sin, they just began to whittle away and finally Jesus stood up and looked around and there was nobody there but the woman. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Forgiveness is an act of gentleness. Jesus didn't condone her sin, and he didn't say, all right, it's, it's all right to do that. Uh, uh, you know, just be careful and be, you know, make sure you don't get caught again because this is really time. No, he didn't, he didn't condone her sin. He didn't say, okay, what, what's hurting you? Just, you know, be more careful about it. But he, but he did change her situation through kindness, and the way he responded to her was gentle because what they wanted to do was stone her to death, but he treated her with gentleness and respect. And so gentleness or forgiveness is an act of gentleness in this world, and gentleness is, a, is an act that reclaims the world that, that belongs to God because it affects people's lives. And so even though gentleness may not seem like it's a powerful weapon against evil. It seems gentleness seems a little soft and a little fluffy. Imagine what it would be like to live in a world that didn't have gentleness in it. I mean, who would want to live in a world that doesn't have kindness and gentleness in it? And a better question would be, who would want to live in a world forever that has no gentleness and no kindness? In Hebrews chapter 11, there's a big list of people who accomplished great things through faith. I mean, it's a long list, too. The whole chapter is about great accomplishments that happen through faith. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Moses did this. By faith, Sarah did this. By this. faith, Jacob and Esau. And by faith, Noah. By, and it goes all the way down the list by faith. And then it comes to the last part of the chapter. And it concludes with, All of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God had promised us something that he would save our soul and change our life and we would go to heaven when we die. And, 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 yet, and yet all of these in this tremendous list said, he said, they hadn't received the promise yet. But then the next line says, but God, having provided something better for us, describing the fact that God has given us something that is better than all of the promises that God has, by gentleness and by kindness, God has offered us eternal life. You know, it, it, it is the kindness and the gentleness of God that allows us to receive something that we don't deserve. What does the Bible tell us about the reality of where we are in relationship to the kingdom of heaven and our lives? Well, in Romans 3.10, it says, there is none righteous, no, not one. That means if you look beside you, if you look behind you, if you look in front of you, if you look in the mirror, <laughs> you're not going to see a righteous person. 
that there's not one single person that has ever lived on this earth except Jesus Christ himself that is righteous. Billy Graham's not righteous. Mother Teresa's not righteous. The Pope's not righteous. I'm not righteous. You're not righteous. There is none righteous. No, not one. And the reason why, Rick, Romans 6.23, or Romans uh, 3.23 uh, 3 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. In other words, what we should get paid for a life of sin, wages is what you get paid for what you do. If you work all week, you get paid wages because of, of the work that you've done. So wages are something you earn for what kind of work you do. And the scripture says that what we ought to get paid for this life of sin, because we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and there's none righteous, no, not one, that what we deserve, the wages of our sinful life, is death physical death and spiritual death, to be separated from God and goodness forever. That's what we've earned. And then right in the middle of 623, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but, and but always changes things, right? But the gift of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the patience of God, the greatness of God, the love of God, the peace of God, the joy of God, the long suffering of God, all of the characteristics of, of the fruit of life gives us something that we don't deserve. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5 says, uh, uh, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we got good enough. Not when we changed our life to be worthy of this, but even while we are sinners, Christ Jesus. In other words, when I was as bad and wicked and evil and, and, and unrighteous as I could possibly be, when I deserved righteousness less than ever, it was at that point that Jesus crawled on a cross and gave his life and died for me even though I didn't deserve it. Yeah, yeah. And then if I will confess with my mouth, <laughs> Romans 10 says, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if, I, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Not may be, not might be, not probably will be, but you shall be saved. And that's an act of kindness because we get what we don't deserve. And it is through an act of kindness and gentleness and graciousness that God changes the world one soul at a time.